Hey folks, Andy Patton here. The Zags put together an excellent second half to defeat the San Francisco Dons after struggling a little bit in the first half, still secured the victory. We're going to talk all about that game, recap my five things to watch before discussing some Zags in the NBA updates on some of our big man, DeMontis Sabonis' injury, Kelly Olynyk's return from his injury, all right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to take you through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. I want to thank all of you who make this podcast your first listen of the day and those of you who make this show your first watch of the day on YouTube. We have surpassed our goal of 250 subscribers. We are barreling towards 300. So any help any of you who are listening to this can give, go out there, search Locked on Zags on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. I sincerely appreciate it. The Zags took care of business on Thursday. It was not their easiest game in the WCC slate so far this season. In fact, it was quite obviously their most difficult game, which is not a surprise for those of you who have been listening to the show. I have been talking about how strong this USF roster is. They have the size. They have the talented guard play. They're well coached from Todd Golden. They had the ability to give Gonzaga some fits, but this team proved to just be overwhelmingly too talented too deep to, to to struggle in a significant way in the second half. Gonzaga went on a 17-2 run in the first half, but other than that, it was pretty much all Dons all the time. It was 36-33 to at halftime, thanks to a Jamari Bouye three-pointer right at the buzzer or right near the buzzer. Really outstanding half from them, particularly in the first few minutes. You could tell USF and Coach Golden had a really strong plan in place when they started the game, they knew what they wanted to do. They knew where they wanted Gonzaga to be, what kind of shots they wanted them to be taking. And it worked. It was very, very efficient to start out the game. You could tell that they were ready to roll. And then Gonzaga finally got their stuff together, got things in gear. The biggest story this was, and we've probably said it before, and I'm not going to lie, we'll probably say it again. But for right now, I am labeling this the Chet Holmgren game. He was outstanding from tip till the end of the game in this one, finished with 22 points, nine rebounds, and four blocks. It doesn't jump off the page in a super significant way, but it was clear to anybody watching this game how impactful he was on both ends of the floor. He had 22 points on seven of 10 shooting, two for four from beyond the arc, six for seven from the free throw line. Just a outstandingly efficient performance from the freshman superstar player. He hit a couple, he had a corner three. That was a really significant shot on a nice feed from Anton Watson. He just, he had an alley-oop dunk from Drew Timmy on an inbounds play. He had the, he blocked a shot on the very first possession of the game. Just a really all around solid performance from him. He's one of those players that is, and Drew Timmy is similar in a way, although we'll get to Drew Timmy because he had an interesting game. But Chet is a player that it that that you can game plan as much as you possibly want, but he's really difficult to completely subdue. He he's no matter what the analytics say, no matter what kind of plan you come up with, he's going to find ways to beat you. And that's what he did here. They had plans in place on how to stop him. They clearly were ready to roll. They were trying to go at him to try to get him in foul trouble, which is a strategy we've seen a lot of teams implement. And he has such good body control, such awareness of how to use his size to his advantage without committing fouls, something that is really rare for all collegiate big men, but extremely rare for freshman big men at this level. It is extraordinary, his ability, especially against a big man as good as Masalski from USF. He's a talented player. The you know University of San Diego transfer having a great year for the Dons, averaging about 15 and 8 coming into the game. And Chet was so good against him without committing a lot of fouls, without coming down on the arms, without moving his feet too late. He just had an excellent game defensively. We know that he's good on the defensive end of the floor, but for him to come out and drop 22 points in a game where Chet, where 
excuse me, where Drew Timmy really, really struggled offensively. And I know it's weird to say that in a game where Drew Timmy finished with a team high 23 points. But again, if you watched the game, Drew did not have his normal self offensively. He was one for eight at halftime. One of the worst shooting halves that I remember seeing from him. And you could see it. He was frustrated. He was clapping his hands. He was kind of shrugging his shoulders a little bit. He was upset at his offensive performance. And part of it was just the the size of Masalski. He's a physically imposing person who had the ability to frustrate Drew Timmy just by using his length, his athleticism, his body control, and his size. Part of it was USF's defensive strategy to try to make Drew Timmy uncomfortable, get him out of his comfort zone. He shot two threes very early in this game, did not make either of them. They were wide open. I understand why he took those shots. But there's a reason that he was wide open. He's not, hasn't proven himself capable of knocking down those shots. And USF was willing to let him take them. Then in the second half, we saw a different player. He got more comfortable. He found more opportunities to, to do his post moves, to get, to use his elite footwork, to use head fakes, get position, get underneath guys, get lay-ins that way. Misalski obviously got in a little bit of foul trouble, which helped his ability to get open looks because he was afraid to commit more fouls. He finished nine for 20 from the field. So that's a much, much better field goal percentage in the second half. He had four boards and four assists. He had a really nice block shot on Bouye on the other end of the floor. Not a great defensive game from him otherwise, but a nice block shot there. The thing I love about Drew is he's still constantly engaged in the game. He doesn't give up. He doesn't roll his eyes. Even in a game like this where Chet clearly was was kind of ta- shouldering some of that load. Drew didn't just say, okay, well, this is Chet's night. I'm going to just kind of step aside and not do anything. He clearly still wanted to be involved. He still wanted to get his looks. He still took on a leadership role. One of my favorite moments in this game was Hunter Salas, who was wide open on offense, didn't get a pass thrown to him. USF went on a fast break. He came down the floor. He was trying to catch up to Masalski, and he committed a, a foul as, Mas- as Masalski was laying the ball in. So dumb foul. I don't think it was a, it was a little bit of a frustration foul, but it was more just him making a mistake, a, a freshman mistake. They happen, right? And Drew grabbed him immediately and talked to him, and he wasn't, you know, he, he wasn't yelling at him or anything. He clearly viewed it as a teachable moment, and that's the kind of thing you love to see from your leadership. You want to see that kind of stuff from your veteran players, from your, you know, the guy that you rely on the most on this team. So for him to be still doing that in a game where he's struggling, he doesn't have it. It would be easy to expect him to just kind of recede into himself and focus on what he can do to improve his performance in that game. But he didn't do that. He continued to look for ways to make his teammates better, not just with his passing or his floor vision, but by legitimately grabbing his teammates and talking to them and educating them in the game. That's the kind of stuff you love to see from a player like Drew Timmy. Beyond that, Andrew Nemhard, great game from him as well. He picked up three fouls in the first half, so we didn't see a lot of him Early in the game, he did finish with 10 points and seven assists. I believe the statistic was posted by the former host of the Locked on Zags podcast, Stephen Carr, on Twitter, who said that Nembhard is the, I think he's the only point guard since Josh Perkins to have four consecutive games of six or more assists, uh, again, with seven in this game. He also had four boards and three steals. Just a nice, kind of quiet, but still all around very solid performance from Nembhard. We'll talk more about Jamari Bouye in the second segment as well when we go over my five things, but he was outstanding. I'd be, I would be, I would feel bad not mentioning him in the first segment here. 25 points, eight boards, uh, played all 40 minutes for the Dons. Just a truly special talent. There's, there's always a couple of guards in the WCC who really stand out as elite level players who aren't on Gonzaga's roster or BYU's roster. Bouye is one of the best that I have ever seen in a non-Gonzaga or BYU WCC uniform. All right, more about Bouye, more about the other four things that I wanted to watch ahead of this game. We'll kind of go through them in the second segment. Before we get there, though, let's talk about NetSuite. This is it. The putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software? To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system out there to power your company's growth. With visibility and control of your finances, inventory, HR needs, planning, budgeting, and more, 
NetSuite is everything you need to grow as a company all in one convenient location. NetSuite lets you automate your processes and close your books in no time while keeping you ahead of your competition. In fact, 93% of businesses surveyed increased their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. Right now, through the end of the year, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program to those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA. Head to netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA for special end-of-the-year financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. That's netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton. Still locked on Zags, and we're still recapping Gonzaga's win over the San Francisco Dons on Thursday evening. Uh, This morning, on Thursday morning, I posted my five things to watch for this game. Those are the things that I'm specifically going to be looking for throughout the contest. I want to go through those now, talk about how how they went in the game and what it means for this Gonzaga team going forward. Uh, Number one was a simple one that uh, did not come true. Can Gonzaga top 100 points for the fourth consecutive game or 110 points is the way that I labeled it. They obviously did not do that. It was pretty clear very early in the game that that was unlikely to happen. They only scored two points through the first media timeout at the under 16 minute mark. They had 36 points at halftime. Again, they were winning at halftime. So hats off to them for that but it was pretty unlikely that they were going to then top 100 points after only scoring 36 at half. They did have a great second half. They were far more efficient from the field, although they struggled from the three-point line. We'll get to that a little bit later, but they still finished with just 78 points. Far from bad, 78 points would be very good for a lot of other college teams, but didn't quite get up to that 95, 100-point mark that we've been kind of talking about a little bit. I mentioned in recent episodes when talking about whether Gonzaga is going to average 95 points per game or score over 100 points in half their WCC games. Those are some of the takes that we got uh, for Andy Locks earlier. And I mentioned that the two games against USF and two games against St. Mary's have a really good chance to disrupt a lot of that. And this was kind of that instance here. Yeah, part of it was that Drew Timmy had a had an off shooting night and Gonzaga didn't shoot well from three. And if those things correct themselves the next time these two teams play, I think Gonzaga could absolutely get up close to 95 or 100 points. But 78 points is going to hurt their ability to average some of those numbers uh, for the rest of the WCC slate. Next up for my five things to watch, will Gonzaga face guard Jamari Bouye? For those of you who watched last week's game against BYU, Gonzaga displayed a face guarding defense against Alex Barcelo from the Cougars where they just had Rasir Bolton just right in his face. He wasn't playing help defense. He was just playing defense on Alex Barcelo. That was it. That was his sole focus. I thought there was a chance Gonzaga might attempt to do that against Bouye. They did not from any indication that I saw in this game. Uh, they kind of took the strategy of, Let's see if anybody else on on, uh, San Francisco's team can beat us. And obviously they were trying to guard Bouye. It's not like they were just letting him do whatever he wanted, but he proved to be very difficult to guard. He has an elite handle. He's a great ball handler. He's a great outside shooter. He's good at finishing around there. He's just a really good scoring basketball player. He had 25 of this team's 62 points, 25 out of 62 That is well over a third of their points came from Bouvier in this game. Again, he played all 40 minutes. Part of the struggle for San Francisco was Khalil Shabazz picked up his fourth foul early in the second half, which really made it more difficult for them to get in a rhythm offensively because Bouvier is so used to having Shabazz next to him. But this is kind of something we've seen Gonzaga do. Again, I don't think they were letting Bouvier do whatever he wanted, but we've seen a lot of really good WCC teams that had a really good guard and a, and the rest of their roster wasn't quite up to par of that particular player. I think Anthony Ireland from LMU comes to mind, Alec Wintering from the University of Portland. Those are two guys that kind of jump out to me right away. And Gonzaga would kind of accept that, hey, that guy's probably going to get 26, 28, 30 against us. But if we hold the rest of the team to 30 or so points, we're going to be fine. And that's what happened here in this game where Gonzaga allowed Bouye to score 25 or he went out and got his 25 points, but the rest of the team struggled offensively and Gonzaga secured an easy victory. Number three, how does Gonzaga look beyond the arc? Uh, Bad. They did not look good from beyond the arc in in this game. They were four for 10 at halftime. So 40%, that's great. Uh, Only 10 attempts, but still you you can't be upset about them being 40%. But then they only went one for eight in the second half, five for 18 from the game. Again, it just wasn't a big part of the 
game plan, it seemed like. I, I think the, one of the earliest things that the broadcasters talked about in this game was that Todd Golden was willing to let Gonzaga shoot threes because they were so concerned about stopping them in the paint. And that's a totally justified strategy, not just from uh, from anybody who's watched the games. I think you would you would come up with that strategy, even the most recent games, because Gonzaga is so good at scoring from under the paint that you got to you got to test them. You got to make them beat you from beyond the arc. And Gonzaga has proven that they can do that. They did it against Texas Tech. They did it against BYU. They did it against Santa Clara. But I think you have to make them do that. And that was San Francisco's strategy. They came into the game saying this is what we're going to do. And it just didn't it didn't happen. They tried and failed. <laughs> and Chet Holmgren scored a lot of points under the basket. Drew Timmy, despite having an off shooting night, scored a lot of points under the basket. Anton Watson scored in double figures. They did not stop Gonzaga's big men from scoring. So the Zags were able, I think if you told Todd Golden before the game, hey, the Zags are going to make five threes, he probably would have been pretty happy with that. I think that was okay with him is, hey, they're going to they're gonna take 18, they're only going to make five. And Drew Timmy's going to have the worst shooting night of his season. That sounds like a recipe for a victory. And unfortunately for the Dons, fortunately for the Zags, Chet Holmgren stepped up in a major way, and they they were obviously able to secure the victory despite a, an off shooting night from beyond the arc. Next up, number four, big night for aggressive Anton. Yeah, Watson had a nice game. It wasn't a huge standout game. He basically was right around his season averages. He had eleven points, five rebounds, pair of assists. Didn't play a ton of minutes because Gonzaga relied really heavily on Drew Timmy and Chet Holmgren in the second half. So we just didn't see a ton of Anton in this game. But when he was on the floor, he looked good. He had a three. He had a really clutch three, to be clear. It was a really important shot for Gonzaga, and he knocked it down. He also made a really nice pass out to Chet Holmgren in the corner for him to knock down a three. Those were two really significant shots in the first half, and Watson had a hand in both of them. So another nice night from him. I, he was a little quiet. Uh, not a super significant game from him, but again, 11 and five is definitely a, a quality night from your third big. And he was instrumental on both ends of the floor as he always is on defense. And then last but not least, uh, coming into the game, Gonzaga and USF were number one and number two in block shots in the conference. I was curious who would win the block shots category. It went Zags four, USF four, Chet Holmgren four. Chet obviously had a significant impact defensively as a rim protector. Again, something that we can say about every single game that Chet Holmgren plays. Four blocks in this game, the same number as USF total. Masalski from USF only had two in the game. Nolan Hickman picked up a pair of blocks, uh, which was really nice for Gonzaga. Not something that I expected to see, but he had them both on the same possession against Khalil Shabazz. Not something that was super consequential to this game. Obviously, we know that Chet Holmgren's a great shot blocker. We knew Misalski would get a few of them. I thought it might have a little bit more of an impact on the final score, but it ultimately ended up being probably only slightly relevant to the final box score. But again, Misalski, not a player who's used to having his shot block, and Chet did it on the very first play of the game, which probably helped set the tone a little bit, even if Gonzaga did struggle out of the gate. All right, so the Zags are off on Saturday, so we don't have a preview in the final segment like we normally do for Friday shows, but we got a Zags in the NBA update. We're going to talk a little bit about Kelly Olynyk coming back, DeMontis Sabonis suffering an injury, a little bit about the Corey Kispert and Rui Hachimura connection in Washington, all of that in the third segment. Before we get there, though, let's talk about Bet Online. Bet Online would like to wish you all a happy new betting year. As we continue our march to the playoffs and beyond, even in 2022, Bet Online remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action. In fact, with a new year comes a new updated desktop and mobile website. Sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code Locked On to get started. From football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports. All right, segment three here. Still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags, and we're looking towards the league. Some Zags in the NBA updates. Last Earlier this week, we talked a little bit about Jalen Suggs coming back from his injury, back with the Orlando Magic. It was great to see him back in action. We, at the time, we talked a little bit about Kelly Olenek. He was said to be returning from his three-month absence with the Detroit Pistons. He only played in 10 games before suffering an MCL injury. He is now officially back, and he made his presence 
very well known in his first game back in a Pistons uniform. He played 22 minutes and he scored 22 points with nine rebounds and five assists. An outstanding performance from Olenek. He had a highlight reel play where he blocked a shot on the other end, blocked it off the backboard. One of his teammates picked the ball up, went coast to coast for a lay-in. Kelly trailed the entire time. The player missed the lay-in. Kelly grabbed it off the rim and dunked it home. Really outstanding play. The kind of play that you would expect from him. These are the kind of plays that Chet Holmgren makes all the time. And Kelly was by no means the shot blocker that Chet Holmgren is in college. But that's that's the kind of stuff he does. He's he's a decent enough rim protector. He's a good outside shooter. He's just a savvy basketball player who makes all of the right decisions. His first game with with Detroit back, him and Sadiq Bay combined for, I think, 55 points or 52 points maybe. A really nice front court combination for the Pistons. Obviously, they have Isaiah Stewart as well. I don't know how long Kelly's going to be in a Detroit uniform. He signed a three-year deal, but Detroit may look to offload him and get some some more young talent coming back. But he's a great mentor for the young bigs that they have, and I'm excited to see him back and healthy in a Detroit Pistons uniform for right now. Uh, Speaking of guys getting back and healthy, Zach Collins is close. He's so close. A name that people haven't heard in a long time. He has only played 11 games in the past two NBA seasons, and most of them were in the bubble when a lot of fans had kind of tuned out. He was, of course, with the Portland Trailblazers in both of those seasons, but was unable to get on the floor. He was signed by the San Antonio Spurs this offseason. The only update we kept getting throughout the start of the season was he'll be back sometime after Christmas. Sometime after Christmas apparently means this weekend. According to Zach Collins himself, he has returned and played in the G League with the Austin Spurs his first game with that team. He had eight points and two assists. He said after the game, the plan is for him to play one more game in the G League on Friday. So if you are listening to this on Friday, he is expected to play tonight. If he if all goes well there, he is expected to return to San Antonio over the weekend. I'm very curious to see how he fits into their rotation. They have a lot of a lot of big men, not a lot of great big men, but they have a fair amount of people. So how he kind of fits into that mix and where he ends up playing, does he play a lot of five? Does he play some four? Kind of what the team ends up doing with him is something I'm super interested in. But really, I'm just happy for the young man. I mean, it's been such a such a a hard time to go through two years of only playing 11 basketball games. I mean, I have to imagine that's just so stressful when you're in your early twenties and you know, you're, you're missing valuable time where you're, you're young and could be, you know, your your shelf life as a basketball player is not very long and it's really frustrating to miss so much time. So I'm glad he's going to be back. Hopefully he can make a nice impact for San Antonio down the stretch. Sticking with the theme of injured bigs in Gonzaga uniforms, DeMontis Savonis suffered an ankle injury uh, on Thursday during their the Indiana or on Wednesday night during Wednesday's game uh, against the Lakers. Uh, the initial report was that his injury was significant, which was pretty frightening. Now, the most recent report, as of a uh, very late PM on Thursday night, is that it is just going to cost him a few games. So hopefully, he does not have to miss a lot of time. Indiana could really use him, although. They are not a very good team, so if he were to be injured for longer, it would probably help the Pacers go secure themselves. Uh, Somebody like Chad Holmgren, potentially, or Paolo Bancaro, or somebody like that. Uh, But it sounds like he's only going to miss a few games, so hopefully he'll be back soon. Maybe the Pacers can then use that to potentially trade him. Uh, Before that, he might make his third All-Star game. He's very, very close at this point. Uh, the most, a lot of the recent returns kind of showed him on the outside looking in as maybe not quite an all-star caliber player, but he has tried really hard to shut those people up uh, in the last 10 games for the Pacers. He's averaged 22.6 points per game, 11.8 rebounds, and 6.9 assists. So that is 22 and a half, 12, and 7 outstanding numbers there. Those are above the numbers that he put together for his best season last year in the NBA. Again, it's going to be hard to make the all-star game in a really crowded Eastern conference, particularly if he misses the next couple of games right before the actual all-star game itself. That's never a good time to be hurt, but his numbers this season are, if not worthy of being on the all-star team, they're pretty dang close. And I think he's going to have a ridiculous second half provided that he is healthy. And last but not least, it's so fun to see Zag's teammates. We've talked a lot about the connection between Killian Tilly and Brandon Clark and how it's great that they are on the same team. Unfortunately, they cut into each other's playing time. Uh, That's happening a little bit in Washington as well now that Rui Hachimura is, of course, back 
with the Wizards. He has been only back for a couple of games, but he has been very, very good. Uh, he's averaging 7.7 points, three rebounds, and only shooting 41% from the field. So it took him a little bit of time to kind of get his rhythm back. But over his last two games, we've seen the Rui that we know and that we love. 12 and a half points, five boards, 53% from the field and 50% from downtown. What has also happened since Rui has been back, Corey Kispert has been really, really good. I don't know how much those things are related or if it is just a coincidence. Kispert in his last 14 games, which dates back farther than Rui's return, but in his last 14, he's averaging 9.8 points, 2.9 rebounds, one and a half assists, shooting 47% from the field and 39% from three. That's the dude. That is the guy that we need to see in the NBA. Corey has a lot of skills that make him a good NBA player. But if we're being honest, the skill that got him in the league and the skill that is going to keep him in the league is outside shooting. That is it. His ball handling skills, his defensive skills, his scoring around the rim skills, his rebounding skills, passing skills, all of that stuff is fine and adequate, but it will not matter if he cannot knock down outside shots. Last 14 games, 39% from three. That's where he needs to be. He needs to live 37 to 40% right in that range. And if he can continue to do that, which I have all of the confidence in the world that he can, if he can do that, he will be an NBA player for a very, very long time. This is a great start. Him and Rui have had some great plays together, some passes back and forth to each other. Corey kicked one out to Rui for three recently in a game. Super fun to see those highlights, the Zag connections, of course. I'm glad they're playing minutes together. I was a little worried because they're both kind of small ball fours that they would potentially cut into each other's playing time. Haven't really seen that yet, but of course, Washington is kind of gingerly getting Rui back into full game shape. Uh, as the season goes on, he's going to play more minutes than he has so far. That's going to come at the expense of somebody. <laughs> the way Corey has been playing lately, there's a good chance he doesn't lose too much playing time, but we'll have to see what ends up shaking out in Washington. All right, that is going to do it for me today and for this week. Super fun to see the Zags get another victory. They are off on Saturday, so we will be back on Monday for Mailbag Monday, as we always are right here on the Locked On Zags podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button there if you have not already. Finally, thank you again to those of you who make this show your first listen of the day. Now's a great time to make your second listen of the day, the Locked On Bets podcast. Locked On Bets is your daily one-stop shop for all of your sports gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. All right. Thank you all for listening and go Zags.